Hi there, I'm Andrea Koppel, and it's time for Coffee, the podcast where you get to hear firsthand what the jobs and careers that interest you the most are really like. Hey there, Java junkies. Welcome to another K-Cup mini episode of Time for Coffee. By the way, K-Cups come in three sizes, single, double, and triple shots, or roughly one minute, five minutes, or 10 minutes in length. So if you don't have time to throw back an entire caffeinated career conversation, these K-Cup mini episodes of T4C can give you a quick caffeinated fix, whether you're on the go or you only have a few minutes to binge. So grab your mug and take a chug, because it's time for a caffeinated career triple shot K-Cup with my guest, Kathy Jentz. How many home gardeners are there in our area? So there's a few different ways to look at that demographic. Some people say that every homeowner and the homeownership percentage in the Washington, D.C. suburbs is very high versus rent or in a small apartment. So whether you're in a townhouse or a condo that might have some outdoor area access or in a single family home, that can be considered you're at least planting up a couple containers outside your door and or uh, really going to town on your landscape. But the figures for gardeners across the entire U.S. population or anything between 30 to 50 percent is the estimate. So I think it's really because people are self-reporting what you consider gardening. And for some people, the definition of gardening is that person that I hire to cut my lawn. And so I'm not a gardener. Or they might think of gardener as growing vegetables only, but the rose bushes and the annual flowers they take care of and plant, that's not gardening, that's decorating my yard. So (laughs) there's some semantics to it, but it's generally thought of to be at least a third of the population who are making annual trips to independent garden centers, who are reading garden catalogs, who are planning and doing and not just going to a grocery store and grabbing a geranium, say. Which is me, but okay. All right. So how many (laughs) millions of people would you say roughly fall into the gardening category? So it could be 40 million in the U.S. that they would consider one of their hobbies, one of their pastimes to Mm -hmm. be gardening. Mm -hmm. So every week they might be spending an hour, they might be spending more than that. And it's gardening is consistently rated one of the top three, if not the number one hobby in the country. Has it changed at all since the coronavirus force Mm -hmm. many of us to stay in our homes. We're doing this interview at the beginning of June. And I Mm -hmm. actually noticed that you had an article in your May edition that has 10 tips for growing victory gardens in containers. And I'm Mm -hmm. guessing that there are some young listeners, Kathy, who may not know what a victory garden is. Yeah, so we included that article because there are, since the beginning of March with the COVID stay-at-home orders, a great deal more people who have time on their hands to pursue gardening or grow houseplants indoors, or they are interested in feeding their household or growing organic food. So Victory Gardens came about First, they used to be called war gardens in World War I when they were encouraging the American public to start growing their own food so they could send more food from professional agriculture to the fronts, to the war fronts. And then they started to realize, hmm, that's kind of a negative term, war gardens. <laughs> the USDA flipped it and changed it to victory gardens. So grow something to help the troops and for victory. And that term has come in and out of vogue over the decades. And personally, I'd rather use another term like foodscaping than victory gardens, but that's being adapted now in the COVID times for something positive for people to pursue and a term that people can kind of coalesce around for marketing. Sure. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, for those of our listeners who may be driving, whatever, running errands and 
can't read the article that's featured in Washington Gardener Online. Could you share just a handful of the tips with us? How can we start a garden in a container? And Mm -hmm. what size container, what kinds of containers do you recommend? So my biggest tip is bigger is better. So when you have several small pots, say on a balcony or your deck, they dry out very quickly. So especially in the hot summer sun and then you're constantly having to water them and then they're under a lot of stress when they're drying out between watering. So when you go with a large container, say something that's 24 inch diameter or 36 inch diameter, you can put several plants in together and water them all at the same time. And that holds the moisture in a bit more. My other big tip is not to use topsoil or soil dug from the ground in your containers because containers need a much lighter mix. What you'll do is go to a garden center and you would look for a bag that says potting mix. It won't even have the word soil on it. So it'll just be potting mix, which is generally peat, vermiculite, and some other lighteners, soil lighteners. Because what happens is you, say, would plant a cherry tomato or maybe a couple peppers in the pot in a heavy soil, and then it rains, and then it compacts the soil, and then the roots of the plants aren't able to expand and get any oxygen, and then they just kind of rot in a container. So you just have that heavy, wet kind of slush soil. So you definitely want to look for a specific potting mix for containers. And then for what to plant, you'll need to know how much sun and exposure you have. Maybe you have an ideal situation, which is a south-facing balcony, say. In that case, you can go for the more of the sun-loving vegetables like tomatoes and peppers. Or if you're north-facing or don't get as much sun or in a climate where it's just not as sunny, you could try out lettuces and peas and some more of the cool season and shade-loving plants. I actually think my backyard may be south-facing. Yay. 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 That's ideal. So, and that helps because you might get morning sun and afternoon shade and afternoon when it's the most like scalding hot time of day, that helps to get at least that part of the day not to be direct sun and then have the rest direct sun onto your edible plants. It's hard for a lot of people in inner city and older suburbs to get enough sun for vegetable growing because usually we have large mature trees blocking a lot of the stones and we want those trees because we want that shade and we want that cooling effect obviously in the summertime and in that case that's when I would look into getting a community garden say or talking to maybe a relative or a friend at work and to say, hey, you have a huge sunny backyard. Are you gardening? Are you using it all? And in most cases, a lot of seniors say would be like, oh, I'm barely getting it mowed. And then maybe you can carve out like a 10 by 10 plot and then share some of that produce back with that person to use some of their space. Thanks for tuning in to this K-Cup mini episode of Time for Coffee. If you want to listen to our entire caffeinated career conversation, please check out the show notes for this episode. Thanks so much for listening to Time for Coffee, where the professionals in the jobs that most interest you always have time to grab coffee 24-7, no matter where you live. I have one quick favor to ask you. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe to Time for Coffee. Thanks so much.